Hi friends, interested in intermittent fasting? Here are the 10 best ways to do it. Now there are several ways to do intermittent fasting. Some people do the 12 to 12 method in which they're fasting for 12 hours out of each day and they don't eat for the other 12 hours. Some people do the 16, eight method in which they are fasting for 16 hours in a 24 hour period. And then they only eat for eight hours in a 24 hour period. Or they can do a 24 hour fast in which one day for 24 hours, they don't eat. Or people do a five to two day fast in which two days out of a week, they're only eating about 500 to 600 calories a day. Now this video will help you choose which method is the healthiest for your body. And since you have less time eating, you should really be preparing your body to fast. It's important to do so so that your health doesn't suffer. Just so we're on the same page, let's define fasting. Fasting is a period of time in which you are calorie free, meaning you aren't eating or drinking anything with calories, which can range from a few hours, like when you're asleep, to a few days. Now I would caution anyone who has any medical condition from fasting for more than what they are already doing. And if you are interested in fasting and have medical problems, please see your own physician. The longest anyone can survive fasting without medical supervision is at most a few weeks. The longest anybody has tried to do it is about a couple of months as shown by prisoners who went on fatal hunger strikes. Now the longest ever documented fasting is 382 days. And that was done by a 27 year old young man named Angus Barberi, who lost 180 pounds under medical supervision and actually kept most of his weight off for the rest of his life. Now, fasting advocates often refer to his case to highlight the safety of fasting. Guess how long he lived? Until he was 50 years old, only 25 years more, and he developed kidney disease during his fast, which many fail to highlight. So fasting is not necessarily safe and nor is it necessarily at a longevity endeavor when done improperly. And this is why you have to make sure you are well hydrated during your fast. So number 10, drink water or decaffeinated drinks like teas or coffees. Remember, you're not fasting from water. Now, most people need at least 64 ounces of water a day, depending on how much water they are losing. You will lose the most amount of water from just breathing and your kidneys can adjust how much urine you're going to lose or keep. So if you're not urinating because you're dehydrated, when you do urinate, your urine will be super yellow. That's actually a sign of dehydration. Sometimes you'll also notice your mouth and lips will feel parched and you hopefully will be more thirsty, but that doesn't always happen in everyone. Remember how you would check your infant's wet diaper to gauge if the infant was nursing enough? Well, if you wear a diaper, that same skill set is useful for you to gauge your hydration status. And for everyone else, we need to look in the toilet. Remember, temperature also affects how much we sweat. Some people thermoregulate very well and excessively sweat, or they may sweat a lot from exercise or possibly get a fever and that may cause them to sweat. All these can make people more dehydrated. Now, of course, if you're sick, you have diarrhea, vomiting, or you burn yourself, a third degree burn, these are all ways to get more dehydrated. If you are more physically active, then you do need to drink more water to make up for breathing faster and sweating. You should be aware of your hydration status every day, regardless if you're fasting or not. Remember, you can drink decaffeinated tea and coffee if you don't like water because they won't break your fast as long as you don't put any calories in it. Oh, by the way, don't put sugar substitutes, even though they may not have any calories because they're just gonna make you more hungry and they're gonna destroy your gut microbiome. Now avoid caffeine since that is a diuretic and will make you more dehydrated. Now usually when you are eating, you should really be getting most of your hydration from your food. And that won't happen if you're eating dried food. Not only is water important for survival, but adequate amount of water can help reduce hunger, reduce infections, and maintain your mental clarity, your blood pressure, and flush your kidneys and bladder so that you don't collect stones, which is a known risk factor when you fast. Now, many people fast because they wanna lose weight or they wanna improve their metabolism from diseases like diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular diseases. When you fast, your blood glucose will drop, but your body has mechanisms to protect you from going to zero because if you do, that means you're going into a coma. So in my previous videos, I have repeatedly stated that sugar is required for life, but some people misunderstood that statement and thought I was saying 
you need to eat sugar or you need to eat carbohydrates. You don't really need to eat them for survival. You can choose not to eat any sugar or carbohydrates, but your body will still make all the sugar it needs. So my statement stands correct. Sugar is required for life. And you can prove this to yourself by checking your own blood sugar, regardless of your diet or even when you're fasting, and you're going to get a value. Depending on what your body is used to, if that glucose number drops too low, your nervous system should kick in and give you warning signs that you're bottoming out or having hypoglycemia. Normally, you shouldn't get these signs of low blood glucose if your liver is working properly because a fall of glucose stimulates your pancreas to secrete a hormone called glucagon, which tells your liver to activate an enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase to break up liver glycogen stores to release glucose. This is called glycogenolysis. Now you have roughly 24 hours of glycogen storage under normal activity in your liver before fat is activated for energy. And if you don't eat, and on top of that, if you exercise like athletes, you can actually deplete your liver glycogen within two hours. And then by that time, the body is going to use muscle glycogen, and then it takes about 24 hours of carb loading to replace that muscle glycogen. This is called gluconeogenesis and is not the preferred way to make energy. Therefore, your fat stores will be used where triglycerides are released from your fat cells. And hence, athletes, they can eat a lot of carbohydrates and they don't seem to gain weight because they have low fat stores since they're using up a lot of their energy very quickly. Now triglycerides get broken up into fatty acids, which the liver converts to ketones to use as fuel. During fasting, when you make ketones, you know you are losing body fat. Those ketones make your blood acidic and acidic blood will release minerals like calcium to buffer the acid which circulates through your kidneys. However, too much calcium clumps together and that forms kidney stones. Now, where does this calcium come from if you're not eating? Your bones. Unhealthy fasting diets or weight loss medications can have unintended long-term consequences, such as the possibility of bone fractures. Now, I mentioned it takes 24 hours to restock muscle glycogen, but when you're fasting or on low carbohydrate diets, or if you're just not eating enough carbs to restock that liver glycogen, you're not going to grow more muscle. Muscle is the one organ I am trying to build as people over 40 just naturally will lose muscle every year. No matter your age, if you do resistance exercises, you can slow down the process of losing muscle, but wouldn't it be better to build muscle with those exercises? If you do the wrong diet, like the ketogenic diet, you may not be building any muscles. Like this study showed, these people worked out for eight weeks and didn't build any new muscle. They just maintained their muscle. Definitely just fasting, that's not gonna build muscle either. Now in the last few years, I've been more consistent at moving and using light weights. So I'm actually stronger now than when I was in college. Your muscles are your health safety net and you can change them at any time just with your diet and lifestyle. I know nobody's perfect with diet and when that candy bar and hamburger sneaks in, your muscle can buffer that sugar and fat toxicity by simply moving it and absorbing that sugar and fat. But when you lose your muscle, you become more susceptible to the inflammation caused by sugar, salt, and fat. And don't forget your muscles are your number one friend when it comes to preventing fractures because strong muscles simply prevents falls. Remember, it's important to keep the river flowing by keeping yourself well hydrated so that you can prevent calcium stones from crystallizing. But calcium stones aren't actually the most common stones people get when they fast. They get uric acid stones. Number nine, if you don't want to be at higher risk of uric acid stones, then you should avoid prolonged fasting times. And that is definitely fasting for greater than 24 hours. Actually, anyone who is on a high protein or high fat diet is at a higher risk of nephrolithiasis, which is a medical term for kidney stones. Here's what happens. When your blood is acidic from ketones, your kidneys reabsorb a molecule called citrate, responsible to alkalinize the pH of your urine. A normal urinary pH ranges from 4.6 to 8.0. However, if your pH is below 5.5, you are at risk of collecting stones. Sodium citrate is actually a medicine doctors give to people to prevent kidney stones and metabolic acidosis. As a reminder, pH is referring to the amount of hydrogen ions in a solution. If the solution has more hydrogen ions, then it is more acidic. And if it has 
less hydrogen ions, it is more basic. This 1927 study tested people without diabetes. Now it split 23 male medical students into four groups with four diets. Group one got a pretty good quality high protein diet with lean meats and egg whites. Group two had a high fat diet with oil, mayonnaise, cream, and butter, which I'm sure keto dieters would approve of. Group three actually got nothing to eat. They fasted for two days. And group four had a high carbohydrate diet with oats, brown rice, potatoes, fruit, bread, and and then they added syrup, candy, and pastries. Pretty much group four, I think, hit the jackpot. Probably had the tastiest meals, but it was mostly junky carb. That sounds like the standard American diet to me, except it was missing meat and fat. Now, then all four groups were given a sugar challenge after two days. They called it a dextrose tolerance test, which is the same as a glucose tolerance test. This is how gestational diabetes is diagnosed. Without a sugar challenge, you actually don't know if you have insulin resistance. And take a look at this graph. The people who fasted had the highest spike in their glucose, followed by the people who ate primarily fat. And surprisingly, the people who ate the high carbohydrate diet had the best blood sugars. So this means if you are going to get a glucose tolerance test, you don't want to do it after fasting if you can help it. Now remember, this study was only for two days. And again, people who fasted and ate a high fat diet, they were the ones who had the highest spike in blood sugar. And this is another reason why I don't think fasting for more than 24 hours is healthy or will it be sustainable? And I figured sometimes I have no choice but to fast when I'm sick because I'm so nauseous. And being insulin resistant is the body's own defense to restock on your energy stores. So personally, when I'm not sick, I try not to fast unless I'm super busy and I just forget to eat. So let's talk about minerals. 99% of Americans lack potassium in their diets. This is such a important mineral. Unlike fat, sugar or protein. You can't just whip up potassium from your body parts. You actually have to eat potassium. So number seven is to eat potassium rich foods in between your fasting. Your body's potassium levels also influences citrate metabolism. Potassium is found abundantly in leafy greens and beans, but that's not going to help you unless you actually eat them. And this is why if you're on dialysis, your nephrologist will tell you to avoid those foods. However, you can always ask your nephrologist for binders to help remove that potassium. And if you keep your diet pretty constant every day, then you will know exactly how much of the binders you need to drink. So make sure you work with your nephrologist if you have any kidney issues. It is important to eat these leafy greens and beans because they have lots of other nutrients that are not potassium. If you have organ failure, please don't fast on your own. Work with a medical doctor who knows how to help you. However, for the rest of us, when we fast, we should always tank up on green leaves and beans in between our fasts to tank up our potassium because you will actually lose some potassium in your urine. Potassium is super important for your brain to think, for your heart to pump, and for you to have good blood pressure. Obviously, if you don't have good blood pressure, you're not gonna think well and your heart isn't going to pump well. However, potassium has such a narrow therapeutic window that too much or too little can give you irregular heartbeats. In a healthy state, it is normal to lose some potassium in your urine. However, if you're vomiting or having diarrhea, then you definitely will lose even more potassium. Many of you probably have had a blood chemistry panel. You're going to get a breakdown of your serum sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine levels, oh, as well as blood glucose levels on that chemistry panel. Doctors are trained to write it like this. So when I see this grid, I know it's a basic metabolic panel or chemistry seven. These laboratory values represent seven different minerals and metabolic products that your body makes. These minerals and products are circulated in your blood, which will change in real time depending on your hydration, your pH, your food, your hormones, and your inflammation. This is why when you're hospitalized, we actually check this daily. And sometimes when you're on long-term antibiotics, we check it weekly to make sure that your kidney function is normal, your blood acid base is balanced, your sodium potassium are balanced, and that you have normal blood sugars. 
Here are the normal ranges of these labs, but keep in mind that each laboratory is different, so individual labs may vary slightly, but, but wherever you get your lab done, that lab will tell you their normal range. It's kind of cool how everyone has access to their labs on an app, and you should actually check it. You should know these values and compare this year's values to last year's. However, potassium stores in your body don't correlate well with your serum potassium because we aren't measuring your total body potassium, but instead we're only measuring the little amount that that's in your blood. Potassium rich diets, lower blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, you should actually focus on getting more potassium rich foods in your diet. Good blood flow is the most important asset to keep you looking young, feeling young, and actually staying young because blood delivers supplies and clears toxins. So if you don't want wrinkles, eat potassium rich foods to lower your blood pressure. Now, blood pressure is really dependent upon a balance between sodium and potassium. Your blood pressure rises when you eat sodium because sodium stays in your blood, which is bad for your body. So you get thirsty and you retain water to dilute that sodium. This is why people get heart failure, edema in their legs, or high blood pressure when they eat too much sodium salt. The only way to get rid of salt is through your urine and sweat. All types of sodium from table salt to soy sauce to Himalayan salt stimulate the angiotensin converting enzyme to cause high blood pressure except for one, miso. Eating miso has been shown to lower people's blood pressure despite having sodium. Soy protein in miso inhibits angiotensin converting enzyme activity just like what blood pressure medications called ACE inhibitors do. Now the effects are not as dramatic but it can still relax blood vessels to lower blood pressure. This is how powerful eating real food is and people who regularly drink miso soup seem to also have lower heart rates. Remember your body actually does an A plus job on sodium conservation. Think of your sweating ancestors gathering food in the field for hours. There was no salt that they could add to their food. They just ate real food as is, which already has a lot of sodium. Now today, every man-made food you buy has added sodium, purposely placed to make your food tasty, to get you coming back for more. But added excess sodium increases inflammation, increases your own body's production of fructose, an inflammatory sugar known to cause fatty liver, high blood pressure, and insulin resistance. High sodium is associated with exacerbations of multiple sclerosis, an inflammatory autoimmune condition, and lupus, another serious inflammatory autoimmune condition that can end up in renal failure. Both conditions are not curable. The pop star Selena Gomez has lupus and had a renal transplant in 2017. She still has lupus and it can destroy her new transplant kidney if she gets a flare. Now, how much sodium should you be eating? Ideally, less than 750 milligrams a day, including the salt that is already naturally in your food. So really, how much food is that? Well, 750 milligrams of sodium could be three ounces or eight large non-breaded frozen shrimp. Or you can eat 750 milligrams of sodium in one cup of a canned soup, or you can eat two ounces of ham, or one cup of vanilla pudding, or one cup of cottage cheese, or two cups of a vegetable juice, or one cup of a canned vegetable, or one cup of beef broth, or three tablespoons of a salad dressing, or one pizza slice, or four inches of a submarine sandwich made out of cold cuts. If you ate all of these things in one day, you would be exceeding your sodium limit and would have eaten 8,250 milligrams of sodium, and you will likely still be hungry. Now, everything I just named barely has any potassium, which are primarily found in beans and dark leafy greens. Less than 2% of Americans are meeting the minimum required potassium intake. So you don't need that sodium rich electrolyte drink if you're eating the standard American diet with pre-made foods from grocery store shelves or restaurants. Each packet of that electrolyte drink is really an inflammatory packet of sodium. Personally, I've never tried an electrolyte drink, even when I ran my half marathon. You don't need added sodium unless a medical doctor, I repeat, a medical doctor with a board certification is giving you that specific medical recommendation. In fact, if I had sodium problems, I would consult a nephrologist because they are the expert MDs in salt regulation since that is the job of the kidney. By the way, your sodium level in your chemistry panel is not necessarily a reflection of your sodium stores, but in fact, a reflection of your water retention.
So if you have low sodium, that may be because you are retaining too much water. And we commonly see this in people with heart failure or liver disease. When physicians correct abnormal sodium levels, we always take in consideration the person's fluid status. Now you can imagine if you're dehydrated and you have low potassium and low citrate, that is a perfect storm for stone formation. And that happens in people without fasting. Most stones are painless, it's only painful when you're trying to pass it. Did you ever make crystals with a super saturated sugar water solution and die as a child? It's really neat. And you can teach your kids about crystal formation and the formation of stalactites and stalagmites, which also depends on acidic water. Imagine passing one of those crystals in your ureter, which is a small thin tube that is 1.5 to 6 millimeters. One centimeter is the length of a staple. So the maximum diameter of the tube that connects Next, your kidneys to your bladder as less than half a staple. If you can get a stone in that tube, imagine how it would struggle to reach your bladder. From there, it has to go through your urethra, a tube that allows you to directly pee in the toilet. The urethra is again half a staple size, half a centimeter in diameter about five to seven millimeters. So if your stone is greater than one centimeter, there's no way it's gonna pass. If it does pass on its way down, you're gonna have massive amounts of pain and know what it feels like to deliver a baby, except the end product won't be so cute. Passing a kidney stone isn't like passing a round smooth marble. If you've ever seen a crystal under the microscope, you'll see all these sharp, jaggedy, and pointy edges. Those tips, that's gonna jab your tissues like needles. And that is why I don't sew. And that's also why I'm not a surgeon, because I don't like needles, especially when they are poking me. My husband bought me a sewing machine one year because I wanted to learn how to sew, but I never opened the box because I just don't like needles. Besides the pain, kidney stones, they can make you bleed and you can get a condition called hematuria, which is basically blood in the urine, which actually can be invisible to the naked eye. The perfect setup for then a urinary tract infection, which is a perfect setup to sepsis, which is the third leading cause of hospital deaths. This is what I see and treat as an infectious disease specialist. However, most stones are silent. Unfortunately, they can silently still be causing inflammation that can lead to permanent kidney damage. One in seven adults watching this video has kidney disease and nine out of 10 with kidney disease, they don't even know they have it. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm trying to give you the facts of life so that you can be well-informed to make better lifestyle choices. One in 10 adults watching this video will get a kidney stone in their lifetime. Now, if there was a lottery ticket that would give me a 10% chance to win, I would buy a lottery ticket every single day and start giving them out during Christmas. The most common stone form is calcium oxalate. But most people who are getting oxalate stones, they're not eating more plants, despite the fact that plants have oxalates. Now, how do you get oxalate stones if you aren't eating plants? Well, your own body makes oxalates, which are made from an amino acid called glycine. Glycine is found in meats and animal products like dairy and collagen. Now, some people also think high dose vitamin C can increase oxalates because they are found in the urine of people who ate more vitamin C. However, it seems like the data may be erroneous because when you don't properly store urine samples, frozen urine samples actually make oxalates artificially on reheating and by adding certain solvents. Half of America is deficient in vitamin C, yet one in 10 will get a kidney stone. So I am not convinced vitamin C has a direct correlation with kidney stones. I also know intensivists who are doctors who take care of people in the intensive care unit who give super high intravenous doses of vitamin C for sepsis, like nine grams a day directly in patient veins who have actually low blood pressure because they're septic and they have not observed a problem with kidney stones. But I wouldn't try taking nine grams of vitamin C in one day, you're not gonna feel good because excess vitamin C will literally flush out your stools by drawing in water and then you may have explosive diarrhea.
That's your body telling you you've exceeded your capacity for vitamin C absorption. Now, some of you may have noticed that you pee more when you take vitamin C. And that's because vitamin C acts like a mild potassium sparing diuretic and helps you pee sodium. Now, this is one way vitamin C helps to reduce blood pressure. Hence, number six, eat foods rich in vitamin C between your fasts, like fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and included in every meal. If you eat fruit at the beginning of your meals, it is more efficient for weight loss since they are high in fiber, high in water, and low in calories compared to other foods that are rich in protein, rich in carbs, rich in fats, and also rich in calories. Now, in my videos, I suggest eating plants, and many people are worried about oxalates. Some people have genes that enhance oxalate absorption in their kidneys, or they may be absorbing excess oxalates in their gut. For those people, they really should be lowering their animal protein intake and go on a predominantly whole food, plant-based diet, but avoid the big three high oxalate vegetables, spinach, Swiss chard, right and beet greens. Now this may sound surprising to you since all vegetables, fruits, nuts, and grains have oxalates. But it's been shown that people who eat more fruits and vegetables tend to get fewer kidney stones. And when you remove fruits and vegetables, the risk of kidney stones increase. And this is probably because those who eat more fruits and vegetables are alkalinizing their urine and an alkaline urine prevents all kinds of stones. And by the way, alkaline water does not alkalinize your blood, but fruits and vegetables do if you eat enough. You can dip your own urine to measure that progress with a urine dipstick, or you can boil red cabbage and use that cabbage water. I used to boil red cabbage to make pH paper strips to teach my kids about acids and bases. And to test your urine, just boil some red cabbage and pour that into your toilet after you pee. If the water starts turning to a shade closer to blue, you are doing a great job at alkalinizing your urine to prevent stones. However, don't go overboard and start juicing spinach, which is high in oxalate. One lady with gastric bypass and taking prolonged antibiotics actually shut down her kidneys because she's decided to do a 10-day juice cleanse, drinking two cups of spinach a day, which gave her an oxalate load of 1,200 milligrams in one day. And unfortunately, she had the perfect storm for oxalate toxicity. First, she had a gastric bypass, and that puts her at risk of higher oxalate absorption. This is because she can't process fats. And people with fat malabsorption problems such as these conditions, including gastric bypass, will absorb more oxalates. Normally, when you eat real food, your oxalates bind to calcium, like when you eat green leafy vegetables, and that forms calcium oxalate in your gut. Calcium oxalate can't get absorbed. It gets trapped in your stool to be flushed down the toilet. But when you eat excess fats, or if you have excess fat in your gut because you can't absorb the fat, that dietary fat traps the calcium, preventing calcium from binding to oxalates. So if you don't want to have high oxalates, then you really should not be eating a high fat diet. Now, second, the antibiotics destroyed her gut microbiome, which has actually beneficial bacteria that can digest oxalate called oxalobacter fermenogenes. Oxalobacter fermenogenes is not universally present in everyone, but populations that abstain from antibiotic use tend to have a higher prevalence of this bacteria. And this is another reason to avoid antibiotics. Pretty much all plants have oxalates with the highest in leaves and seeds, but 90% of Americans don't eat enough fiber, hence they're not eating enough plants. There's actually 300,000 edible plants. You have lots of options. And personally, I'm not worried about oxalates as when I eat, I eat a diversity of ingredients, but I target high fiber whole foods to cultivate my gut microbiome to get that calcium in to bind those oxalates. So I do limit my spinach, my beet greens, and my Swiss chard so I don't have to overcompensate with eating more calcium. And when I do cook those vegetables, I'll often cook them in water and throw the water away so that I don't get excess oxalates. And by doing so, this can remove 60% of the oxalates. This is why I like kale, because you'd have to eat 6,000 cups of kale during those 10 days to get that kind of oxalate poisoning. But if you do have a history of kidney stones, you should avoid spinach, beet greens, and Swiss chard, because they are extremely high in oxalates, and there are so many other nutritious greens to choose from. As for the rest of us, eating more oxalate-rich foods will barely make a dent in our serum oxalate levels if you're not eating a high-fat diet. Number five, when you eat, it is best not to overeat. And when you fast, you are skipping meals and that is really how you're losing weight. 
by losing calories. But if you make up for it, you will counteract the benefits of fasting. That is why eating once a day is not recommended and has been shown that people tend to overeat. Now, the two most practical fasting techniques are the 12 and 12 or 16 and 8. Longer fasts have not been proven to be better than daily time-restricted eating. Calorie restriction is a key to health and longevity. Now, number four, it's best to fast at night as your pancreas is more sluggish at night. So you have more insulin resistance at night, which means you're going to have worse blood sugar spikes if you eat late. And this is why night shift workers have more metabolic problems. Your body has a routine. It has a circadian rhythm. And in the morning before noon, it's really the best time to eat because that's when your cortisol and insulin are the most responsive to handle stress. In the evening, your body is quieting down to sleep. So if you eat late at night, it's not really set up to metabolize your calories. So your hormonal response to food will be more sluggish. And this results in higher blood sugars, which will result in more fat conversion. And this is why number three, it's best to include your sleep as part of your fasting time and to add fasting hour around your sleep before and after your desired goal. For example, if you sleep for seven hours, you are essentially fasting for those seven hours. If your last bite was at least two hours, preferably three hours prior to bed. And that's about 10 hours worth of fasting. And remember the metabolism of fasting doesn't start until you finish digesting your foods. It's not just when you finish chewing. So if you drink milk before bedtime, you literally just broke your fast. To be clear, if my last bite is after dinner, then I can sleep through the hunger. So if I wanna do a 10 hour fast, then I stop eating at 7 p.m. And if I wake up at 5 a.m. from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m., that is 10 hours of no eating. Now, if after that, I add two more hours to my morning of fasting, which to me is no big deal because I'm usually not hungry, then that is a 12 hour fast. And number two, to be most successful, keep yourself busy with a project during your fast. And hopefully the project has nothing to do with looking at or smelling food. There's something about the brain that makes people panic when they are told they can't eat. And I see this all the time because when people need to go for a procedure, they have to fast. We call this NPO, nothing by mouth. People simply get more hungry when they are told not to eat. When I was told not to eat before my screening colonoscopy, I started to get hungry, despite the fact that I only abstained from food for less than 12 hours. And that's something that I commonly practice because I just don't eat when I'm so busy. During my medical career, I have worked over 12 hours straight. My longest shift was like 36 hours during my residency, which is now actually illegal. But when I'm super busy, I often forget to eat. Now, number one, it's really hard to fast when you are hungry as all you're going to think about is food. And that's why it's important to load up on quality food, rich in micronutrients, such as vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients with an intact fiber shell when you do eat. Vitamins such as thiamine, B12, B6, B2, and vitamin C are important for energy metabolism. Most of these B vitamins you cannot store and the more active you are or the more inflamed you are, the more you will need. Zinc and magnesium are also energy producing minerals and we know billions of people around the globe are deficient in zinc. And the most common symptoms of zinc inadequacy is bad skin. There are also lots of phytonutrients in foods such as curcumin and turmeric, bromelain and pineapple and a plethora of antioxidants and berries, green tea, and mushrooms that aren't thought of as essential for survival, but I think they're essential for longevity. And all these rich micronutrients are wrapped in a special protective layer called fiber, which is really indigestible carbohydrate that fills you up and keeps you full for the rest of the day and for the next day. For example, fibrous whole beans release energy slowly over time, unlike drinking a can of soda or chugging down a glass of orange juice or eating a bowl of rice. All of these sugary starchy foods will spike your sugar and insulin and then bottom your sugar to make you more hungry and irritable. On the other hand, a bowl of chili with whole beans has a second meal effect. And if you've not heard of that, the second meal effect is when the bowl of chili literally helps you eat less food in the following meal, as well as lowers your blood sugar in the following meal and your blood cholesterol. So how is this possible? When you eat whole fibrous foods like beans, 
beans. Even though you can't digest it, your friends in your gut can digest it. That gives your guests that live in your gut, called the gut microbiome, food to eat. Whenever my mom had guests in her house, she would bring a ton of food out and insist that they eat. My in-laws are the same way. And I think it's really an Asian tradition to feed their guests the best foods that they have. It's actually considered rude if you don't serve your guests food. Now your daily guests, they live within your colon and the best foods are rich in phytonutrients and fiber. You should want to feed them because these friends can make you beneficial molecules if you give them the right ingredients. And when you don't, give them carbohydrates like fiber, they're going to eat your protective mucus lining that separates you from them. And that's called an ulcer. You don't want that. But the thing is, your friends, they don't eat until several hours after you've eaten. They're like that puppy dog under your dining table, hoping you'll drop them some leftovers. And just like that puppy, they get very excited when they get fiber that makes your gut microbiome happy. And then they turn those fiber those prebiotic molecules into postbiotic molecules like short chain fatty acids called butyrate, acetate, and propionate that stimulate and release GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, which shuts down your appetite. Now people pay thousands of dollars for this. It's called Ozempic and Wegovi, which both mimic GLP-1 molecules And that's how people lose weight. Unlike those expensive drugs with numerous side effects, eating whole foods is affordable with tons of side benefits. Now remember, when you don't eat, you're not going to be able to get those vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients that your body can't store unless you supplement. Now I've been practicing time-restricted eating for over 30 years before I even had my first email account. And before it was even called time-restricted eating in 2007, I know how difficult life can be when you don't get in the right food and when you don't have time to eat. Fatigue and brain fog are two things I used to struggle with in college and as a medical student and a young resident physician studying and working for over 100 hours a week. Life doesn't get easier when you are working on a low gas tank, especially when you have a family of small kids. Many of my colleagues actually go to work to get a break from childcare. But as a working mom, there are no breaks for us. And so that's when I began to supplement. Actually, I started with prenatal vitamins because it's a standard of care for all childbearing women to supplement with a prenatal vitamin to make sure that they give their babies the best chance to be healthy. Now, after my pregnancy, I found a better cocktail to help me with energy and mental clarity because the right micronutrients in the right proportions are essential for a healthy metabolism. Especially when you're working 100-hour work weeks, it's really hard to find all the nutrients to eat when you can find the time to eat, let alone sleep. So if you want to learn about micronutrients, check out the next video.